But there are other forms of incorporation for other types of corporate entity. Savings and loan associations, sometimes called building societies, they need a constitutional document. Cooperatives, frequently found in Canada as groups of supplier organizations, and in the UK as a customer organizations. State corporate entities, uh, financial national mortgage association, the well-known Fannie Mae in America, has its own constitution uh, documents. And similarly for not-for-profit organizations, charities, sports associations, universities, colleges, all need their form of constitution, which lays down the, the, the rules by which it's going to be governed, and in essence creates that entity which is to be managed on the one hand and governed on the other. In essence, therefore, corporate governance consists of the members, shareholders in the case of a limited liability company, who have the duty to uh, elect the governing body, which, working with management, runs the organization. And the governing body owes a responsibility in line with the constitutional document, owes a responsibility to the members. The responsibility to show the stewardship that they've exercised over the uh, assets of the members, over the resources of the members, and their responsibility to achieve the objectives of the organization. The past 20th century was very much a century of management. You could say that 19th century, which we talked about in the first uh, lecture, was a century of the entrepreneur. The big companies that were formed were ones where individuals gave their names to, to the company, the Rolls and the Royce, the, the Marx and the Spencer. That was the 19th century, entrepreneurs. The 20th century was a century of management. It was a century in which management schools were, were founded, management books were written, management gurus, uh, uh, produced all sorts of ideas. Management consultants were at their heyday. It was a world, managerially, in which organizations appeared like this. Not always exactly in that form, but typically this is the way you would think about management. There's a boss and layers of management. The managing director, the chief executive officer, through the layers of management, Responsibility is delegated and the layers of management require accountability up through the hierarchy to the boss. Where's the board of directors? Board of directors didn't appear, still doesn't appear on the organization charts of most enterprises. How are we going to depict the governing body of the entity on top of the organization of management. I like to do it this way. A hierarchy of management, the pyramid of management, is a fine conceptual vehicle. Of course we all know it's not simple, not a simple triangle, but the idea of a boss and layers uh, delegating responsibility with accountability up to is the essence of classical management thinking. Superimposed on that is the governing body. In the governing body, in the circle of the board, you can now see there are two types of directors. They can be in two places. There'll be those directors who are both in the circle and in the triangle. They're your executive directors. And there'll be those directors who are in the circle but outside the triangle. There are outside directors or our non-executive directors. This very simple diagram will enable us to chart any governing body that you can imagine. But in essence, we've separated governance from management. What are their duties? How do they differ? Well, very simply, I put it this way. Management in the triangle runs the business. The board, on the other hand, ensures that the business is running in the right direction. It's concerned with its strategic focus, and it ensures that the managers are doing a good job. 
Management runs the business, the board ensures that the business is running in the right direction and being well run. Here's a chart created by some of my students a little while ago. It's a, their depiction of the governance and management structure of, in this case, it was a financial institution in Hong Kong. We don't need to worry about which one it is. You can produce this chart for any organization with which you are familiar. But notice, we have three executive directors. They're in the triangle as managers, and they're in the circle as directors. And we have three, in this case, my students have described them as independent non-executive directors. And then down in the management, where there is a company secretary who's concerned for compliance, who would attend board meetings, but is not a director, a general manager, and in, in this case, an investment manager. But we've separated board from management in our thinking. Notice that the board of directors is not a hierarchy. In company law, all directors, executive and non-executive alike, have exactly the same responsibilities. There are one or two minor exceptions, for example, in Australian company law, but in essence, directors all sitting around the boardroom table are equally responsible for ensuring that the business is being well managed and that strategically it's moving in a direction to satisfy the members of the organisation. You might like to try as an exercise outside this lecture to uh, draft the board structure, the triangle and the circle of an organisation with which you are familiar. There have been a number of definitions of corporate governance over the years. Uh, Adrian Cadbury and the uh, OECD uh, came up with somewhat similar definitions when they said corporate governance is the process by which companies are directed and controlled. Notice the duality. On the one hand, directed, concerned with conformance and compliance. On the other hand, controlled. Use the definition produced by Bob Monks and Nell Minow in the United States, who talk about corporate governance being the relationship among the various participants in determining, again we have it, the direction and the performance of corporations. The primary participants, they say, being the shareholders, the management and the board of directors. OECD broadened the perspective on corporate governance, saying it referred to the private and public institutions, laws, regulations, practices, which together govern the relationship in a market economy between corporate managers, entrepreneurs on the one hand, and those who invest their resources in corporations on the other. But one of the best definitions, I believe, is that of Tom Clark from Australia, who simply says, corporate governance is about the exercise of power over corporate entities. Uh, that captures it all in a way. It includes the relationship between the shareholder members and the board, the relationships between the board and top management. It includes all the other uh, interested parties in the situation, as we'll see in a few minutes. When management is separate from membership, all organizations need governing as well as managing. And it's my belief that many of the corporate governance ideas that we find in the codes, which are focused on the listed companies, can be applied to almost every governing body. When management and governance, of course, are in the same hands, as in a lot of family firms, sole traders, then the interests are combined the separation between management and governance hasn't occurred, and uh, the distinction that I've been drawing is not so apparent. 